To her, she's better looking than I am, anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Let me turn Here, well, I guess we should move these out of the way. Make sure all these things are off. I had my, I left my phone on the uh, movies the other day. Uh-oh. And uh, people scowl at Did, um, did you have the, did I give you the 100th edition? No, you gave me this, this one. Oh, but you okay. put it back in your bag oh, so okay. you have I have it. something for you before we start, okay? Yes. And I know we can use that as part of my 15 minutes, that's okay. Fantastic. So you probably have somebody after us. Oh. No. But we are, um, we're actually starting this paper. Okay. And we started nine years ago. Okay. We are getting ready to celebrate our 10th anniversary. Okay. And this is, there's only about 50 or 60 of these left. That's our 100th edition that we had this past year. Nice. So we're a monthly. And uh, we started up, it's actually a tea party newspaper. Okay. But um, what we did was we decided to make it a, um, a local newspaper, so local okay. people pick it up for the local stuff, and uh, hoping that maybe we can influence them to think a little bit more conservatively. You know, when they're not reading the news, all the other pages in between is Christine's column about the Tea Party. Sure. Christine's actually the president of the Greater Boston Tea Party. Oh, so you're up from Boston? Yeah, I live in Haverhill, which is okay. right on the border. So. Super. Takes me all over the state. Oh. So that's for you. You can have that. And if, uh, and when we're done, if I could share a picture of you holding, of course, one of the papers, that'd be great. Uh, so, um, I think we, we could we could start with. Um, I mean, the one thing that I always, when I'm watching you on Fox News, mm -hmm. and when I'm watching your political involvement, um, the, the news media in Hollywood are obsessed with painting people like you, like us, right wing, conservative, Tea Party people, as kooks. Sure. How do you break through that white noise? How do you, when the average person who doesn't pop, pay attention to this stuff every day, doesn't watch Fox News or CNN every day, how do you break through to them when all they're hearing is this constant drumbeat of, you know, the right wing is the haters, homophobes, racist, hate mongers, uh, closed minded, trying to take people's rights away? How do you break through that? Well, first of all, I just challenge the other side on principle. And when you have examples of places such as Detroit, when you have California, you have Stockton, you have San Bernardino, when you have an economy that is uh, really going into the tank, when you have people that are losing their jobs, being put on part-time, you just hit people with the facts and you hit people with the truth. And understand that name-calling is what they have to do on the other side, and you just smile at them and you just continue to press the attack, press the attack. But the great thing is that as they say things like that about you, there are going to be other people that start to, well, who is this, this kook then? And then that gives you the window of opportunity to really, uh, you know, on your Facebook page, whatever, people see certain things and they say, well, I agree with that. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with what he's saying. And you start to provide folks solutions. Now, you know, anyone can take the 15 to 20 seconds and they try to, you know, glorify or whatever. But, you know, I'm not concerned about everybody. There's a 30, maybe 35 percent that they are enjoying the fact that government is taking over more aspects of their lives. There are, are people out there that are happy to be part of a dependency society, but the majority of Americans are not. I would say 60 to 70 percent are not. And those are the people that I will continue to get out there and get the message to, and the other 30 percent will just save them from themselves. Christine Newman. Yes. Um, one of your many projects that you're working on right now is encouraging minorities and veterans to run for public office. Absolutely. Why is it so important that those two groups in particular get involved in the political process? Well, first of all, I would say it's important for military veterans because we understand the sense of service, sacrifice, and commitment to this country. When uh, coming out of World War II in Korea, about 70 to 75 percent of the members up there on Capitol Hill that served in the military, and I think that makes a difference. And I believe that when you have individuals with that type of discipline, they would not leave for five weeks when you see all the critical issues that are facing the Congress right now. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the minority communities, they are conservative in nature. You just need to go back out and then talk to them and reconnect them. And that's why I don't like the word outreach. I believe it should be policy inclusiveness. I'll give you a great example. If you read the writings of Booker T. Washington from the turn of the century, he was really the first black conservative thinker because his whole thought was based upon three principles, education, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance. 
And if that's not conservatism, you tell me what it is. And so we just need to go out and have that dialogue. So our guardian fund and our foundation is really based upon supporting those type of candidates and educating those uh, the communities to get them to realize that it's not so much about party, it's about principle. The, um, the Democrats have seemed to make an industry out of selling poverty, out sure. of selling the message of dependency that you talked about. Sure. Um, and it looks as though they're trying to sell out the country by trying to allow as many illegal aliens in as they can because we all know that if they can follow But you also they, have some Republicans that are part of that too. Oh, we'll talk about that. Well, I think that you know we need to stop reading the Washington Post and New York Times and, and that says if you don't do this, if you don't you know give amnesty and open up the borders, then you're never going to get the Hispanic vote. First of all, that's just offensive to Hispanic Americans. And the other thing is that that's not true. We have to show tangibly to the American people that we're serious about enforcing our laws as far as immigration and securing our border. That's the failure from 1986 and Ronald Reagan was uh, quite sorry that he got, uh, he got fooled over there. So I, I think that you know, if once again we are standing on principle and we're doing the things that are right as far as immigration as well, we are taking a step-by-step -step approach, um, we're going to be fine. Now, the Black American Leadership Alliance, which is really a, you know, the, the leadership of that group are Democrats, but they came out strongly against Senate Bill 744. They went to the Con Congressional Black Caucus to get support, and they told them, you're barking up the wrong tree. So who did uh, that organization, BALA, go to because they wanted to have a rally on Capitol Hill? They asked Senator Jeff Sessions to speak. They asked Senator Ted Cruz to speak, and they asked for me to speak because they know when you look at the unemployment in the black community right now, this will further exacerbate unemployment. It will further depress wages, and the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, already said that. So the facts are on our side, and we can find those places where we can be, you know, on common denominators for us these issues. And so, you know, we don't need to bring in an influx of, you know, illegals that are here to take more jobs from hardworking Americans who want to get back out there and to depress the wages. And so I think that now's a great time that we can find that commonality on that issue of you know, illegal immigration. You have a no-nonsense style of communicating, um, which tends to appeal to those on the right um, how do you respond to your critics that say that some of your language may be bombastic or may turn off um, those more moderates or independents? You know, the thing is, uh, when you're in a firefight, you know, people are looking for leadership. And I used to tell folks, you either get to fight or you get to die. If we don't have people that will come in and stand on principle and wake up the American people, then the great promise, the great dream of this constitutional republic will be lost. And what is interesting is that I've never had anyone say that I was not telling the truth. Colonel, should I call you Colonel? Should I call you Congressman? Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> All right. Well, dinner's at what time? Six? Yeah. We'll try and make sure you get And I'll also tell you, this is Southern quality to be very forthright and straightforward. Mm -hmm. That's how my parents raised me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I often talk um, when we have two party rallies about uh, using the language of the media, the language of the liberal. Those of us on the conservative side always seem to talk about budgets and we seem to talk about welfare. Well, I know fraud. exactly where you're talking, where you're going. We, you know, liberals make the emotional connection. Now, it's all based upon lies and it's really irrational, but they do make the emotional connection. You always hear, you know, we care about you, we're out there for the middle class. There's a war on women and all of this stuff. We need to be able to, as in Judah, take what they see as their perceived strength and counterbalance and throw it against them and, and take their language in turn because we need to make the emotional connection. We need to go in, you know, I'll give you a great example, uh, and I've used this before. In the, the presidential election, you know, Mitt Romney should have gone into Detroit, and, and this is the commercial. You show a picture of Detroit when his dad was governor of Michigan. And you show him standing in Detroit today, and you just talk about the failures of their policies, what they believe. If they really care about you, then why is this happening? Mm -hmm. And then you put them on the defense to try to, you know, live up to their, their rhetoric. And if you read uh, Solomonsky's Rules for Radicals, that's one of the rules, is to make the other person 
live up to their principle. Well, we never do that. Right. We never put them on the defense. They always put us on defense. And we've got to talk about what we're for, not what we're against. And that's the big way that you will be able to win this. The but country- how do we get Republicans to do that? Because as a Republican, I get frustrated watching the candidates that my party nominates not do any of the things that need to be done in order to it's, win. It's and then if we win, it's only because the other guy blows it. Well, it's, it's leadership. Won. It's leadership, man. Right down the road in Boston, you've got the, the RNC summer meeting going on. You know, what would be the grand strategic vision that comes out of that? What are going to be the message? What's the marching orders that we can send down to, you know, the, the state GOPs, to the county chairman, so we can get everyone, you know, operating on a, you know, same sheet of music, attacking on a broad front. That's what is missing right now. And, you know, this is, this is ours to, to gain. It really is. You know, Ronald Reagan talked about in his CPAC speech, you know, bold colors, not the pretty pastels. If we believe that we can only win by being a lesser version of the other side, we're never going to be successful. You cannot, you know, be a lesser Democrat than a Democrat. And at least people are going to say, at least I know what this person is standing for. I don't know what you're standing for. you got to come and stand for something. You know, I, you know people always talk about the tent. Well, you know, I lived in tents for a few years of my life. And the thing about a tent is if, if you don't stake it down, it's going to blow away. It's going to collapse on you. So we need to stake our tent down with principles and make sure it's sturdy and it can withstand any type of you know, adverse conditions. And people will come into it and they'll find shelter. But first of all, they've got to see that that tent is sturdy. In thinking about how powerful black conservatives have been treated by the left, um, Clarence Thomas, Herman Cain, Connelly's Rice, Mark Steele. Right. Yeah. Do you feel, um, as a black conservative, that you're held under higher scrutiny uh, by those on the left than you would be? If you were? We're a bigger threat uh, because the thing is, if all of a sudden the black community, you know, goes back and understands the basic principles of Booker T. Washington, of education, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance, if all of a sudden the black community goes back and understands that. We're failing as far as 28% of our children have mothers and fathers in their home. You know, the great society, the war on poverty, has not given us what we're supposed to. It's made us, you know, less of what we are. If they start to listen to voices such as what you just uh, articulated, um, that's a big problem. Now, do you need to win over the entire black community? No. But if all of a sudden in the national level election, 20 25% of the black community does not vote with the Democrat Party, that's a torpedo on the broad side. Mm -hmm. So when you are a conservative, being it black, Hispanic, or female, they come after you because they cannot have that voice out there. They cannot have that image out there. They cannot have those faces out there. And furthermore, when you eliminate black, Hispanic, female, you know, Asian, you know, Hispanics, I mean, uh, conservatives from the equation, then you can come back and say, see, they're just a part of the little white guys. Mm -hmm. That's why they go after you. But uh, I will tell you that it's starting to backfire. It really is. Because it's a, it's a, if you're complaining about the Obama rodeo clown, then you can't come out and call Alan West an Oreo, uh, an Uncle Tom, a sellout, and all of these things. Where's your outrage about that? Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to show the hypocrisy. Why don't, why aren't conservatives? Or, or we have Harry Reid that says, you know, the president is, is acceptable because he's light-skinned and he doesn't use Negro dialect. That's <laughs> offensive to me. Okay. Yeah, that goes right in line with my next question. Uh, it seems like anytime somebody who's a conservative says something that could be taken out of context, it's a firestorm throughout the country with racism and allegations. But then when liberals say things or do things that are blatantly and overtly racist, I mean blatantly and overtly racist, there's no one on our side calling them out. There's no one on our side issuing press releases, going to MSNBC and the belly of the beast and saying, well, wait a minute, this is the this is the standard you set for racism three nights ago on Al Sharpton's show. Now I want to see, I, and if you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. We're going to call him a racist when we issue press releases, call for boycotts. It seems like there's no will on our side to do well, that. Well, you know. There's a very few like you. But well, but, but we've got to show that you can have courage and, and you can fight through this. And, and that was one of the things that I looked at. You know, all the people that came down to Florida, you know, marching and, and, and making all of this, uh, these riots and protests over the Trayvon Martin case. But yet you just had the three black teenagers that beat up the one teenager in Florida mm -hmm. on the school bus 
and said, Pete. And so I put out a Facebook post about it because no one was really talking about it. No one was talking about the fact that this young white kid turned these guys in because they were selling drugs. Now, first of all, who told those three black kids that that was the person right. that did it? And then, as well, who allowed them to get on that bus? That was not their bus. So there's some adult culpability. But, you know, when you look at what has happened in Chicago, when you look at that incident, when you look at the two black teenagers that shot a white 13-month-old baby in the face of Brunswick, Georgia, we've got to shame them. And that's what I said on, on Greta Von Susser's show this past Monday, was that we have to call them out. We have to call out the hypocrisy. When Joe Biden can stand up and say that Barack Obama is clean and articulate, I guarantee you if a Republican said that about me, they would be up in mm -hmm. arms, they would be apoplectic. Let's call them out on that. Let's get people to understand, you know, when, when you hear folks talking about, well, this whole thing about having an ID to go and vote, that's just the same as poll tax and, and all of these things. Well, guess who established poll taxes and literacy tests? Democrat Party. Democrat Party. Right. Who's the party of the Ku Klux Klan? The Democrat Party. I've got a present for you on that, by the way. I didn't mean to interrupt you, I apologize. Mm -hmm. no. I come along to Massachusetts, 80% mm -hmm. Latino, mostly Dominican. They hold Dominican elections in the Dominican Republic for their president, but they set up polling places in the city of Lawrence in Massachusetts because of the high Demi uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dominican population. So I went down the last three times there was an election, and I took pictures and interviewed people. They have to show a voter ID in the very same polling place in Lawrence, Massachusetts at the Arlington School where we're not allowed to ask them for a voter ID when they're voting in American elections, but in the same booth, in the same place, they have to have an ID to vote in the Dominican elections, but they can't vote. Well, think about this. You could not get into the Democrat National Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina last August without a picture ID. Mm -hmm. So is that suppressing people you know, going in to participate in their convention? But again, it comes back to the courage to be able to call people out on this because they- How do you stimulate the, the right? Because we're, we're not a very courageous party in the last 20 years. We've been beaten down by the media, beaten down by Hollywood, beaten down by you know the different groups. How do you get these guys who are, want to do the right thing? They want to run for office, they're conservative, but they're also petrified of being called a racist or a hate monger or a homophobe, so they walk the line. Well, as long as people know that they can put you on the defense by using the R word, they will use the R word. And until you find the intestinal fortitude to push through that, they're going to continue to put you into a box. And, you know, that's one of the things that we want to do with our Guardian Fund is to get people that will be out there that aren't worried about the name call. They're worried about the country, and they'll push through that. And, and, and until we get courageous leadership, you're going to continue to see, you know, the wishy-washy, mealy-mouth uh, wussification of the Republican Party. And we can't have that. America needs us to stand up. America needs us to be America's party. America needs us to be the loyal opposition. America needs us to show that we will be the bold, visionary leaders to get this country back on the right track so that the promises of you know, better opportunities for each and every one of us and for our children, grandchildren, will be sustained. Christine, last question? We need to wrap it up real quick, but um, just quickly, you have said that Republicans need to start playing chess instead of checkers. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, chess is a, is a strategic game. And in it being a strategic game, you're thinking about the second and third move before you make your move. And that's what we need to be able to do. We don't do that very well. You know, checkers is fun. I mean, it's like bam, 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 bam. And, and that's what we get caught up in. We really need to sit down and have that bold strategic vision that is laid out. And you have to have contingencies, and there's no doubt about that. But you know, hopefully coming out of this RNC summer meeting, they can, you know, here's our plan. Not not this autopsy report that's basically, you know, sticking a hot poker in your eye, but to say this is the direction that we're going in. This is our this are our, our tent stakes. And we're gonna make a sturdy, strong tent for people to come in and find shelter from this failing economy, from this failing uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, we're gonna do something about energy security. We're gonna do something about national security. We're gonna restore some of these traditional values that make sure that we, we don't have children that are being denied the opportunities because we don't have you know, solid family units anymore. That's what we have to talk about. And, and therefore, you'll get the American people to come to you. Ronald Reagan made a clear choice between Jimmy Carter and himself. And guess what? The people want to be winners. Tell us something nobody knows. 
Uh, I really love hot dogs. <laughs> Thank I was you. looking for more like a breaking news story. Can <laughs> <laughs> get a picture of you with the paper? Sure. Can we take it? Oh, that'd be, that'd be even better. Yeah. Great. Sorry if we went over time.